So just a few wrap up comments about hypothesis testing and how we look at the logic of them. And we're going to take a look at jury trials as a comparison. So in a jury trial, we're trying to prove that somebody is guilty. We start by assuming that they're innocent. So we're testing for guilt, not for innocence. We have to retain our null hypothesis that the person is in in innocent, excuse me, until the facts make it unlikely beyond a reasonable doubt. Then, and only then, can we reject the hypothesis of innocence and declare the person guilty. So we have to have lots and lots of lots of proof or data that supports rejecting that null hypothesis. Note, however, if we say that the person is innocent, we don't actually say they're innocent. We just actually say they're not guilty in the judicial system. If our evidence is not strong enough to reject innocence, the jury says the verdict is not guilty. They don't say the defendant's innocent. They just say they not guilty. All that means is that there was not enough proof or not enough evidence to convict the person to reject that they were innocent. The defendant could be innocent, but the jury really has no way to know for sure. This is very similar with hypotheses in that we only claim there's either enough or not enough evidence to reject it. So our same logic in jury trials is used in our statistical tests of hypotheses. We assume that our null hypothesis is true barring anything else. We take a look at our data and we see whether that data is likely to happen, the probability value p-value would be very high, or not likely to happen, the probability value or p-value would be very small. If we find the fate if we find the behavior of the sample is likely to happen, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. So that p-value would be large, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. If the behavior of our sample is unlikely, so the p-value is a very small value, so the p-value would be smaller than the alpha value, then we reject the null hypothesis. So we never truly accept the null hypothesis, we only choose to reject it or not reject it. Now regarding p-values is that we have to really understand what that means. So the p-value is the probability that the event that we've witnessed is likely to happen. So remember the p-value is the probability of our data value, our sample statistic, actually occurring. It's just the prob probability that we're looking for. Remember in our process, we calculated the Z statistic, the Z calculated, and then we calculated the p-value for that Z calculated to see how surprised we are to see those results. That probability is called our p-value, and that's how we base our decisions. If we're very surprised to see those results, in other words, that the p-value is very small, it indicates that, well, probability of that thing happening is very small. It shouldn't have happened, but it did. So that tells us that something is going on and supports rejecting the null hypothesis. If the p-value is very large, it says, well, that has a high probability of happening. It's, we're not surprised to see it. It may be as typical. So then that supports us failing to reject our null hypotheses. Now there's types of errors associated with our decisions. We're not always going to be correct and we have two types of errors. First off, let's look at when we're right in making our decisions. So in this table here we have the truth about our population. Either the null hypothesis is true or the alternative is true. Over here we have our decision based on our sample. We've either rejected the null hypothesis or we've accepted it. So if we accept a null hypothesis, and we're down in this quadrant here, and it was actually true, well, we've made a correct decision. If we've rejected a null hypothesis over here, and it was actually false, so the alternative was true, we actually also made a correct decision. What we're more interested in is these two quadrants here, the type 1 error and type 2 error. And the type 1 error is this first quadrant. And that's where we have, that's what we call our alpha error. 
And the alpha error is saying we reject the null hypothesis when it's really true. So we rejected a true null hypothesis. And that could have serious um, consequences or might not have serious consequences. The other type of error is when we fail to reject a false null hypothesis, so we've accepted it, but actually the alternative was true. And that's classified as a beta or a B-type error. Now for our purposes, this is general knowledge for us, so we're just going to look at two little scenarios so we get a better understanding of how the particular situation could dictate where one error or the other is more important or has more serious consequences. Here's a scenario where we're going to go for a skydiving run and the company we've gone to has some parachutes for us and the null hypothesis is, is that the parachute they give me is going to open. The alternative is that the parachute won't open. I go up and I ask myself, okay, is a type 1 error serious? So if I reject the parachute but it's actually going to work, is that a problem? Well, no, because that's not serious because I'm still okay, right? I'm still on the ground. Sort of the important part comes to choosing the next one, right? What about the type 2 error? Is that serious? I don't reject the null hypothesis, so I accept that the parachute's going to open, but it actually doesn't open. Now, that's pretty serious because I'm not going to be okay jumping out of that plane, am I? So bad for me, but also bad for that company. So in this particular scenario, we want our type 2 error to be as small as possible. What do we tell a patient about his diagnosis? So let's look at a, a doctor situation. So I'm the doctor and you're my patient. The null hypothesis is I'm a good doctor, you're going to recover. The alternative is, sorry, you're not going to recover. Let's look at the type 1 error. So we reject that you're going to recover when you actually do. Well, that's good for both of us in some respects, right? Because you're happy because you've recovered. So very good for you, but maybe your trust in me has sort of gone down a little bit. Let's look at the other type of error, type 2 error. We don't reject the null hypothesis when it's actually false. So I tell you you're going to recover, but you wind up not recovering. So that's bad for you and your family because you're not going to recover or maybe you actually died, but it's also bad for my re reputation, right? Because now I'm not a good doctor. So in this case, again, we would like to control our type 2 error to be as small as possible. Now you'll notice in the questions we've done, we only ever choose an alpha level. And remember the alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error. Because typically we don't want to reject something when it's actually true couple of things that can go wrong with our p-value. We have to be careful how we interpret it. It's not the probability that the null hypothesis, what's generally accepted, is true. It's the probability associated with our data. Okay, It's the probability of our sample statistic happening. We also have to be very careful in choosing alpha levels. We have typically picked 5%. But we could also, excuse me for a second, but we could also have picked 10, 15, maybe 20 percent and come up with completely different decisions in some of the examples we looked at. So we do have to be careful for that. <laughs>